Good evening. Welcome to our Ash Wednesday service as we enter into this season of Lent. Uh, we are going to be uh, uh, talking a bit about repentance, as this is a service uh, of repentance, repenting in dust and ashes, as the phrase in the uh, scriptures uh, is often repeated. But what that repentance is, is not convincing God to be merciful to us, but rather uh, living out of the mercy that God has already given us. Uh, and so we're going to hear a bit about that during our service today. Uh, we will be uh, in, uh, receiving ashes uh, in the form of an ash uh, of a cross on our foreheads uh, later on in the service. Uh, when that time comes, we will be in silence as that happens. Um, and so uh, anyone who desires to come forward is, is welcome to, um, but you don't have to. If you would rather stay in your pew and just reflect or watch, that's all right as well. But that will be coming later uh, in the service as well. Uh, I think that's all the notes that I have um, for us. So I invite you to take a moment now. And we'll have a moment of silence, of quiet reflection, and then we will enter into our service. Our service begins with uh, Psalm 51. We are singing uh, a tone with a refrain. So you'll notice the refrain line there is the create in me a clean heart, O God. And every time you see a little R at the end of a line, that's when we will go into the refrain. So we'll start by singing the refrain through once, and then we'll enter into the psalm. Please join uh, uh, on the bolded verses. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. In your great compassion, blot out my offenses. Wash me through and through from my wickedness and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my offenses, and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. So you are justified when you speak, and right in your judgment. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Indeed, I was born steeped in wickedness, a sinner from my mother's womb. Indeed, you delight in truth deep within me, and would have me know wisdom deep within. Remove my sins with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be purer than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness, that the body you have broken may rejoice. 
Create in me a clean heart, O God. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my wickedness. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Let me teach your ways to offenders, and sinners shall be restored to you. Rescue me from bloodshed, O God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. For you take no delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifice of God is a troubled spirit, a troubled and broken heart, O God you will not despise. Create in me a clean heart, O God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, you hate nothing you have made, and you forgave the sins of all who are penitent. Create in us new and honest hearts so that, truly repenting of our sins, we may receive from you, the God of all mercy, full pardon and forgiveness through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Good evening. The first reading is from the second chapter of Joel. Because of the coming day of the Lord, the prophet Joel calls the people to a community lament. The repentant community reminds God of his gracious character and asks God to spare the people, lest the nations doubt God's power to save. The reading begins with verse 1. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the Lord tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness spread upon the mountains, a great and powerful army comes. Their like has never been from of old, nor will be again after them in ages to come. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relents from punishing. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God? Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the aged, gather the children, even infants, at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her canopy. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your heritage a mockery, a byword among the nations. Why should it be said among the peoples? Where is their God? Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. 
The second reading is from the fifth chapter of 2 Corinthians. The ministry of the gospel endures many challenges and hardships. Through this ministry, God's reconciling activity in the death of Christ reaches into the depths of our lives to bring us into a right relationship with God. The reading begins with verse 20. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, at an acceptable time I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry, but as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way, through great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger. By purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and see, we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing everything. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Please stand. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. First, the introduction. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus commends almsgiving, prayer, and fasting, but emphasizes that spiritual devotion must not be done for show. Real treasure is not found in material wealth or in people's admiration, but in the regard of God who sees in secret. Jesus said to the disciples, "'Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven.'" So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room, shut the door, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head, wash your face, so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Beloved people of God, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, if you were going to ask me to choose two holidays to combine into one grand celebration, I think Valentine's Day and Ash Wednesday might be the last combination that I would consider. I mean, there doesn't seem to be much that obviously connects the two of them. They're so different, their themes are. I mean, on the one hand, we have a solemn day, a day that we add something extra into our schedule as a way of demonstrating our repentance and our desire for forgiveness. And on the other hand, we have Ash Wednesday. 
Did you get it? Yeah, okay. I couldn't resist that one. Uh, anyway, in all seriousness, they, they are quite different. Ash Wednesday marks the beginning of a season of repentance, a time of reflection on our life, on the reality that we are sinners who have fallen short, and that as a result, death reigns over us so that we will return to the dust from which we were taken. Valentine's Day, on the other hand, is sold to us as a day lavish, to lavish our loved ones with gifts, to indulge in a bit of excess, and yes, to spend a bit more money on those cards and those chocolates, all for the sake of expressing our love. At its best, it's a day to celebrate human love which binds us together, whether it is romantic love or the love between family members or the love between close friends. At its worst, of course, it's uh, something else entirely. Maybe you've heard some of the origins, the stories about the origins of Valentine's Day. They're usually going around on Facebook around this time. There's all sorts of different versions, actually, probably because there's at least three different St. Valentines, all of whom are remembered as being martyred on February 14th. And though we know almost nothing about any of them, it hasn't stopped us from coming up with legends. And the most popular one that I could find, and maybe you've heard this one, at least for those who like the holiday, has to do with Valentine, who uh, may have been a priest in the city of Rome, someone who uh, was martyred for his faith in the year 270, so very long ago. And the story goes that the Roman Empire at the time had banned soldiers from marrying, and so when soldiers fell in love, the young couples would come to Valentine and he would marry them in secret. And then after he was killed for his faith, it is said these secretly married couples uh, exchanged gifts with each other, cards perhaps, on the anniversary of his death as a way of honoring him and his commitment to love. It's a nice romantic story. It's a little odd, though, that Roman soldiers would be going to a Christian priest for such a service, especially since Christianity wouldn't be legal for another 50 years in the uh, Roman Empire, and it would be more than a century until it was the official religion, but it's a nice story. Although, if you're not a fan of Valentine's Day, of course, there's a legend for you, too, one that involves a pagan fertility festival, Lupercalia, that was celebrated in the city of Rome around this time of year. And the legend says that after Christianity became the official religion of, of the empire, uh, the Pope, Galatius at the time, instituted St. Valentine's Day as a way of Christianizing this unruly celebration. Maybe you've heard that one. There's not really a lot of evidence for that one either. Uh, however, Lupercalia existed, it was real. But it wasn't widely celebrated. It was really a city festival. There's no evidence the Pope was motivated by it when he created St. Valentine's Day. As I mentioned, we know almost nothing about the three different St. Valentines except for where they lived and where they died. And actually, for one of them, we don't even know that. But regardless of the origins of this holiday, something about it for us seems to inspire stories of love, whether they're legendary, or whether they're more real. And if we think about Valentine's Day in that light, as a time to tell stories of love, well, maybe Valentine's Day is actually the perfect day for repentance, for turning to the one who loves us more deeply than we can imagine. For while Ash Wednesday is indeed a solemn day, an acknowledgement of our fallen and sinful humanity, our enslavement to death. It's also a turning, a repentance to the God who created us, the one who through Christ reconciled us to Himself, even though we preferred other gods, gods of our own creation, of our own choosing. In fact, the only reason for Ash Wednesday. The only reason we can spend this day looking squarely at our own mortality, at our own sin, rather than glossing over it with romantic notions or idealized love, is because God has acted, that God refused to leave us to our own devices and instead took the sin and the death which we heaped upon Jesus and defeated it by the power of His indestructible life. Or to put it another way, it's only God's love, steadfast and merciful, 
that makes repentance possible for sinners like us. Sometimes we Christians get confused on this point. Sometimes we get it exactly backwards, thinking that our repentance must come first, and only then can God's wrath give way to mercy. As though God were a person, perhaps a jilted lover with a sensitive ego, someone who holds a grudge until they've been sufficiently buttered up. Perhaps worse, Christians sometimes, we Christians sometimes, make a similar mistake in how we tell the story of Jesus, as though it was the story of the angry God of the Old Testament simply needing to punish somebody, anybody, in order to get all that wrath out of God's system before becoming the nice and merciful God of the New Testament. But all of that is wrong. And if that's what we think we're doing on a day of repentance like today, paying our dues so that God can stay merciful, well, we may as well go home because we are not understanding God and we're not understanding ourselves. For the story of the Bible, both Old and New Testaments, is the story of a God who relentlessly loves the world God has made. So much so that even when this world becomes enslaved to powers hostile to God, sin and death, and when the human creatures who have been given authority within it reject their Creator, seeking to fashion their own gods out of wood and stone, out of their own desires, this God refuses to give up on them, but calls to them again and again out of a desire to be truly reconciled once and for all, not just in word, but in action, in deed, in life. And we see it in our Old Testament reading for today from Joel. Return to me with all your heart, God cries. The prophet continues, return to the Lord our God, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. It doesn't say, return to the Lord your God so that God can be gracious and merciful. No, return to the Lord your God for this is who God is, gracious and merciful. We see it in our New Testament reading from 2 Corinthians, where Paul's exhorting this church in Corinth to be reconciled to God. Just a few verses earlier, Paul said this, God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and God was entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. That is, God was not waiting around for the world to repent, to desire God, but was acting in Jesus Christ, reconciling so that they could turn and become part of this reconciliation. Not a reconciliation of our own making, but living according to the reconciliation God has already brought about. Not making God merciful, but turning to the God who has been merciful already the God who was not willing to wait for us. And of course, we see it in Jesus, most strongly in Jesus, God in the flesh who came near to sinners of all kinds, who forgives them, who restores them, who turns them, repents them to live as beloved children of God's mercy. In fact, it was not God who demanded Jesus' death. It was that crowd, crucify him, they shouted. And as much as we would like to think we'd be different, I'm convinced that were we there, we would have done the same. For sinners who are set on being their own gods, we hate it when the true God comes and takes away the sin that we're so sure we could handle on our own. And when this true God comes as a man we can take hold of, well, that's what we do. We take hold of Him. We get rid of Him in the best way we can, putting Him to death, putting Him in a tomb, putting the biggest stone we can find in front of it. But even that sin won't keep this God from us, from you. For on the third day, Jesus was raised, and God's love and mercy decisively won the victory. 
over our sin and our death. So, beloved of God, on this Ash Wednesday, this beginning of Lent, I appeal to you, be reconciled to God. Don't enter into this season of Lent as a way of earning God's favor. Rather, turn to the God whose love endures forever, the God who is merciful and gracious, the God who created you, who died for you, who was raised for you. Be reconciled to God, living in the reconciliation that God has already accomplished, the reconciliation which God has delivered to you again and again by the promises poured out on you, fed to you, spoken into your ears, even on a day such as today. Trust in this promise of forgiveness and mercy and love. Rely on your Father who sees in secret, your Father who is in heaven, to provide for all of your needs. Be reconciled to God, for God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Amen. the day. Friends in Christ, today with the whole church we enter the time of remembering Christ's Passover from death to life, and our life in Christ is renewed. We begin this holy season by acknowledging our need for repentance and for God's mercy. We are created to experience joy and communion with God, to love one another, and to live in harmony with creation but our sinful rebellion separates us from God, our neighbors, and creation, so that we do not enjoy the life our Creator intended. As disciples of Jesus, we are called to be to a discipline that contends against evil and resists whatever leads us away from the love of God and neighbor. I invite you, therefore, to the discipline of Lent, self-examination and repentance, prayer and fasting, sacrificial giving and works of love. Sustained by the gifts of word and sacrament, let us be carried through these 40 days to the great three days of Christ Jesus' death and resurrection. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most holy and merciful God, we confess to you and to one another and before the whole company of heaven 
that we have sinned by our fault, by our own fault, by our own most grievous fault, in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. Have mercy on us, O God. We have shut our ears to your call to serve as Christ served us. We have not been true to the mind of Christ. We have grieved your Holy Spirit. Have mercy on us, O God. Our past unfaithfulness, the pride, envy, hypocrisy, and apathy that have infected our lives, we confess to you. Have mercy on us, O God. Our self-indulgent appetites and ways, our exploitation of other people, we confess to you. Have mercy on us, O God. Our negligence in prayer and worship, our failure to share the faith that is in us, we confess to you. Have mercy on us, O God. Our neglect of human need and suffering, our indifference to injustice and cruelty, we confess to you. Have mercy on us, O God. Our false judgments, our uncharitable thoughts toward our neighbors, our prejudice and contempt toward those who differ from us, we confess to you. Have mercy on us, O God. Our waste and pollution of your creation, our lack of concern for those who come after us, we confess to you. Have mercy on us, O God. Restore us, O God, and let your anger depart from us. Hear us, O God, for your mercy is great. Almighty God, you have created us out of the dust of the earth. May these ashes be a sign of our mortality and penitence, reminding us that only by the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ are we given eternal life. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, you are invited as, uh, to come forward, and we'll just form a line in the center, of, uh, center aisle to receive uh, the ashes and the sign of a cross on your, <laughs> on your foreheads. Um, and once you have uh, received those ashes, you're welcome to, if you want to kneel at the rail, you're welcome to do that as a time of prayer for yourself or simply return to your seats. Would you? Yeah. John, remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Amen. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. 
Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you are return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you will return. Accomplish in us, O God, the work of your salvation. That we may show forth your glory in the world. By the cross and passion of your Son, our Savior, bring us with all your saints to the joy of his resurrection. Amen. Cling to this promise. The word of, of forgiveness I speak to you comes from God. In obedience to the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
Please stand. Let us pray. Merciful God, accompany our journey through these 40 days. Renew us in the gift of baptism that we may provide for those who are poor, pray for those in need, fast from self-indulgence, and above all that we may find our treasure in the life of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray together our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Go forth into the world to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve God rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God.